We'll have to clean up. I'll put that in my pocket before I forget it. Uh, now we go to the half inch drill. Like Wall suggested, put a magnetic on your key chuck and keep up with it. Any questions so far? Yes, what size blank did you start with? Uh, good question. About three inches, uh, but it depends on whether you're making a pill box or whether you're making a needle case. Uh, if you want to make a needle case or a toothpick, you know, get a needle, get a toothpick and size it, but about three inches uh, to me is a pretty good size. I've, I've already marked this to the depth that I want with a piece of tape. Three inches by what? Uh, about one inch. When you okay. finish with it, it's going to be about seven eighths. Remember that that the hole is five eighths inch, so that gives you about a uh, seven eighths. One quarter. Yeah, that gives you a really lot to play with. Uh, it gives you room for some design changes on putting some slope or uh, something like that in there. Mike, mm -hmm. when you Mike, when you anchor down the tailstock and you uh, and you send your drill bit in using the crank. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you get a little bit of a plane? Sometimes. Uh, I, uh, some of that is a function of whether you got a starter hole, right. if you're using a, uh, a twist bit. I think on the Forstner bit, since you, I've already got a little, I don't have a hole on this one, I'm just, I'm just going to go real slow to get it started. Right. Uh, I think if you go too fast or too slow, I'm not sure what the magic is. A lot of it has to do with how much play you have here. but. I normally fasten this down. Uh, you can get some play in your quill, but generally not a whole lot. Um, if you've done a lot of drilling, I've heard complaints that people that do a lot of heavy drilling on Pyromatic, on a lot of hollow forms, that you know you can get some wear on your quill, and it'll eventually need replacement. And maybe that's maybe that's what you got. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Fred Warshawski uh, had his replaced. Now I understand on the newer, the big lays, they've got a different design. They've got a different thread that's a lot more rugged on that big 4224 or whatever. That's less likely to have that, that problem. And in normal use, people are not going to have a problem. Mike, I might mention, if you use a big Forstner bit and it starts smoking, you better not touch it. Oh, <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> and how did, and how did, you, and how did you learn that? <laughs> no, I don't know how to do that. Somebody told you. I thought yeah. we were going to have a learning experience. Yeah, they will get hot. They will get hot. And we're going to... We're going to transfer the inside to the outside. Mike, I believe the recommended speed for a Forstner bit, at least the ones I've seen, is about two to 300 RPM. I, it, it really depends on the size. Uh, if you're doing, you know, a two and three inch, it's slow. You can look at a chart. I, I find that uh, less than a thousand, generally on what I'm doing, uh, if I was paying attention, it'd be probably around 900 for the five inches, and I'd probably drop it to 700 for the half inch. And, and I don't think that's too too fast on on the kind of wood I'm using. If I'm doing macassar ebony, I might slow it down a little bit. If I use a bigger drill bit, I'd slow it down. But 
I don't think that's too fast on, on the size that I'm using. Uh, but maybe. Yeah. And it comes loose in your hand, and also there's you know, just some blisters on the inside of your hand, and nothing rotating inside of your hand. When you're pulling it out? Uh, no, when you, when you pull it, 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 it grabs the wood on the inside, and it just twists in your hand. Oh. You know, that's kind of a. Uh, Again, 20 gauge bore brush, keep this clean, and push this in far enough so you take this, make sure this is clean, and you seat it. You know, uh, I don't always do that, but it, but if you're doing heavy drilling, you really need to do that. I know I had some concerns, or I bought one of these, uh, you know, I got it from Steve, one of these big one-inch drill bits that are really nice for boring, and, uh, and then one of my carpool buddies, you know, says, hmm, it doesn't have a flat area where you can grab it with a, you know, a pair of pliers or something like that. And, so I, I contacted uh, Rudy Lopez, who has suggested that, and he said he's never had a problem with them. You just lock them in, and I've never had a problem with it. So if those Morse tapers are very strong if you use them properly and you keep everything clean. That said, I always use a draw bar when I'm using it on this end, unless I'm putting a lot of pressure on it. I don't allow it loose to vibrate vibrate out. I always have a draw bar. I don't know if everybody knows what a draw bar is, Mike. Uh, well, I can pass it around. It's just a threaded rod to secure this in your, your headstock. Now, all drill chucks don't have holes drilled in them. If you're buying one to use on a lathe, I'd recommend it or restrict yourself to using it in a tailstock. I have a very nice one uh, that uh, uh, somebody local sold that was used for CNC, made in China, very nice, very nice, very good price, and it wasn't drilled for one, so I just use it here, and, and, and it, it doesn't use a key, it's a keyless chuck, and it's just really handy. But you gotta recognize that if you use it over here, you might have a problem. Normally, I get to talking, I don't pay attention. This, I, did, I did mark it, so I know which side of the line to, to do. Before I do much else on shaping, what I generally do is I convert the line to a groove. Or a, a beginning of a part, so there's no misunderstanding in my mind exactly where the bottom of it needs to be. Now... I go back to, I should have marked this earlier while it already had it set. Transfer this to this. And just back off of it just a little bit because I like to make my tenon shorter than the recess. Cause you a lot less problems trying to fit this thing if you do that. And just for keeping from chattering, I'm going to support it for just a little bit, for a little while. Now I'm going to uh, go ahead and park this down a little bit. Uh, I brought this parting tool. I don't use it very often. It's a diamond parting tool. People say it's better because it, you know, it's got less steel because of the shape and it doesn't bind. I've heard a lot of turners say, well, it, they have problems with them and they don't recommend them. So you got to pick your, choose your experts and then stick with it until you got enough experience with it to make up your own mind. You just don't want to keep shifting back and forth. And the reason I brought this one is because this is from a, a competitor, well-known competitor down the road that sells these big, long, red-handled tools, and I brought this as a reminder to mention. You know, bigger handles aren't always better, and they sell these great, big, old handle tools for every tool they got. 
whether it's a quarter inch spindle gouge to a parting tool to a bowl gouge, they've all got these real long handles and they're just, it's a marketing gimmick because the handle's too long and I had to wind up take, putting it in a chop saw and cutting it off uh, to give it a, an appropriate uh, length for, for what it ought to be designed for. I learned that lesson the hard way. I, one of the first handles I made, I made this beautiful laminated handle that cherry and maple and for the very first uh, Doug Thompson tool I bought and I carried it to a class with Stuart Batty and and uh, he looked at that and says, well that's a very nice tool. He says, your handle's too long <laughs> for a spindle gouge. Bowl gouge would be different but for a spindle gouge it was too long. And I just hated to put it on the chop saw but I did. Here's a trick some of y'all have probably seen before. Uh, I'd seen it and really hadn't taken advantage of it because it looked like a gimmick, but I finally thought I'd give it a try. And that's you take a, uh, you size a, a rough size a tenon by using a wrench and you just sharpen one end of it. So you get an old wrench. Uh, it's not the finest steel for cutting, but the idea is first of all, you get it close to the way it ought to be to begin with. You want to get at least, at least rough. It's not doing the heavy work for you. It's just going to do this, the initial sizing. And your tool rest needs to be far enough back where you can get over it. Uh, and you're going to press up on the bottom as you go in. If you don't press up on the bottom, you're going to make it too small, you're going to undersize the tenons. So you'll see what I'm talking about. So you kind of press here. Now is that a perfect fit? Absolutely not. But it's a pretty good sizing fit. So one advantage of having a, a tool bucket with all your handles, you've all, you get lots of different shaped handles. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't use this one. I mark them, some of them with a P, so I can keep up with it. Now I know from, from experience that the 5 8 inch on this is a little too big, so I bring the rest of it down to that size. Now I can get this out of the way. And now I can do an approximate fit. And it's just about right. So now all I have to do is size it a little bit. I could use a parting tool. I can use a uh, skew. I can't use a sharpened tool rest. And we're going to get this up to around 1,000 or so. And use this as a negative rake scraper. And then you just trial fit. And you're eyeballing it to, to see, does it look like it's, I'm putting a parallel, making it a parallel uh, tenon. And your initial fit is, is, is going to be real tight. It's not the final fit, but it's, a, it's where you can use this as a friction chuck. I use a piece of uh, shelf to make it a little easier to, to hold this. You don't want to make it so tight that you're going to break it. And if it wobbles a little bit, you can tap it till it runs true. close to true. People say, uh, different experts say, you know, you put your tool rest at a certain height, you put it halfway. You want to put it where your cutting height is right on center. So whatever that means for your lathe and your height and your comfort stance.
I had a lot of torn grain from that uh, parting tool. this up a little bit. <coughs> and then if you're going to do any texturing, you need to sand to the final final finish. I'm going to hit that with that. Hit it with that. Hit it with that. That. And I like to use a, a texturing tool, a little sor sorby, uh, small texturing tool to uh, put a little embellishment on the bottom. It just adds a nice little detail and, and I find what works for me. I'm not going to use the saddle, that's what this is for, to keep it in a certain position. I'm going to come in at a slight angle off center and the speed you're going to use is somewhere 500, somewhere between 400 and 700. And you're going to come in at a slight angle until it's cutting. Lift the handle. And then I'm going to rotate it up. And hopefully it'll give me a bit of a flower look. And I'll show it. You can get a close up. When I uh, punch it up a little bit, I like to put a little bit of a ring to kind of make the texturing pop. I don't know. Can you see the detail on that? Yeah, okay, yeah. It's a little monitor here, Mike. Yeah. I'm not used to looking straight ahead and yeah. turning. So that's that adds a nice little uh, little embellishment. Now I don't want to turn that loose. I'll take this off. Walking and talking, walking and talking. There, do you have to just go along like one time, or does it leave it on it? Uh, you want to leave it a, a little bit while for it to cut. But this tool cuts pretty quick, as opposed to say Ron Brown's best knurling tool or whatever he calls it. I forget, he's got a fancy name, sounds like something you'd texturize meat with. Uh, I think that's what he calls it, Ron Brown's meat finest texturizing tool or something. Yeah. You've got to hold that for about 30 seconds and lean into it because it's embossing. This is a scraper, but it, it, does, it does cut, and it, it, it cuts fairly, fairly quickly. So now we've got to think about what our overall design for the bottom is going to be, and then, and then do a final fit on that tenon. So, you know, design aesthetics, one-third, two-third rule is good. Uh, for these small pillboxes, I have a hard time getting that. It winds up being almost one-half by one-half, and they can look a little bit boxy. Um, let's see. We're going so to just tweak this a little bit. You don't want to overshoot it and have a sloppy fit. If you get a slightly sloppy fit, I never sand these tenons. I say never. It's not my plan to you do the final cut and then when it fits, it fits. If you get one that's late, that when you finish it's too tight, well, then you got to resort to sandpaper if it comes off the lathe. If it's a little bit tight, one trick that, that I found works is you polish it up real good on your bill buffing system including the canuba wax and then and that that allows it to slip on pretty well if it's a, a, if it's not quite snug enough but you know still close you can put finish on it and it might swell the fibers and make it a little bit thicker and it and might help normally i don't put finish on on box tenons or recesses but it is a technique you can use if you have to See if it works for you.
Mike, is that tenon flat all the way, or do you yes. kind of round it over? No, in this case, this is what you call a piston fit. Uh, the, the, the bellied fit is really for shorter, shorter ones for, for boxes. But for this, you don't want that. You want a nice, where it just slides on, and it's the friction, the friction and the air in there kind of holds it. I'm working on the back side. The front side fits about halfway, so I don't want to I don't want to loosen that up any. And I'm just getting rid of getting rid of a little bit of dust is all I'm doing. And I'm taking my time to get a nice fit. Because you hate to make a box with a sloppy fit on a pill box where you know they're gonna carry it in their purse or carry it in their pocket. It, the top does need to stay on. Sometimes by doing this, you can see the burnish marks, so you know where you need to kind of take it off. And I'm also coming in just at a slight angle on the bottom bottom here, so it, it's going up like this a little bit, so it'll it'll touch on the rim if the wood moves a little bit. If you make it perfectly flat, you get some movement. You don't want it to show a gap. And, and by coming in here just a little bit in the back, you can minimize that. One more pass and we're gonna call it good whether it fits or not. This is the part that when you get in a hurry, you know, you, you, you take a skosh more off and it's like, crap. So this is one I'll polish up on the, on the build buffing system. We're going to take one more pass. <laughs> one more pass. One more. One more. Nick Cook says every cut, like it's the last cut, never take the last cut. And somebody else says always take the last cut, which means don't give up too early before you get it right. No, I can't describe it. It's just what the box box makers say, and I follow them, and I don't remember the explanation why. Uh, I think part of it is you, depending on the wood, you're liable to get uneven cut. You, if you get softer wood or you get some sap wood, you know, it's like a bowl. You do too much sanding and it goes out around. And, and the same thing will happen here, and then you'll get a, you know, could be the shape of the grain, any number of things, but cutting it, you'll get a uniform size. Sanding it, it can alter the, the, the size. So now we're going to see if that the design. So we can see this is a little bit fat. I'm going to back off of this just a little bit, but leave it here as a reference. We're we doing a time. We're doing pretty good. So we're just going to. When it comes to a lid join, sometimes uh, you want to disguise the, the join. Sometimes you can't disguise it and you want to mirror it. So in this case, I'm going to put another little bead on the bottom. Uh, put a bead here on the bottom. And then
We'll hit that lick with sandpaper. Get a champ on the up. Design change. <laughs> we got a lot of wood, so it doesn't make any difference. Even out the bottom to match a little bit. Take it back to match. People ask what kind of finish. Sometimes I used to use a lot of uh, HUD or Mylan's friction polish. Uh, it doesn't hold up real well over the long haul, but if you use it a lot, it develops patina on your wood product, and, and it can still look kind of nice. It gets kind of a, a used look to it. I've since started using uh, some lacquer. I've never used lacquer much before. Uh, actually, I have another chance to finish this bottom, so I'll wait until then. I'll go ahead and part it off. Slow it down a little bit to part it off. This is where if you're doing a typical box, you'd make a jam chuck here, but I don't want to take the time to do that. I know it's 5 eighths, so I look into my bag of tricks, see if I can't find a, uh, a mandrel that'll fit. That says 5 eighths, but this is not 5 eighths. This is a half. So that's this one right here. So we'll... So if you're going to do several of these, there's no reason to, you know, keep making jam chucks over and over unless you need to practice, which most of us do, but if you want to make several of them, it's handy to make uh, a mandrel. Since you're doing these over and over with a consistent size, have a 5 8 inch mandrel to do the top. If you didn't get the top just right, or you forgot about it and got in a hurry and parted it off, and I've done that a lot on boxes. Uh, you know, you have a mandrel that, for the top as well. I needed tape on this the other night, but now it doesn't seem to need that much. Well, I think I've boogered that tape up and start all over again. It is sloppy. tape on it. If it's a bigger box, you know, we just spit on it, call it tongue oil, and, and that'd probably work fine. <clears throat> if it's not perfectly centered, it's really not going to matter for the purposes I'm, I'm doing, which is just finishing off the bottom. And it's running true enough. Now, it pays to use sharp tools. I sharpened all these tools before I came here tonight because, you know, as one person says, if it's almost sharp, it'll almost cut. 
Think about it. In this case, sharp and very slow, gentle cuts. Don't get in a hurry because this will spin on here because there's not a whole lot holding it. You get a little bit of chatter from the wood. So you gotta have a sharp tool. And then we just kind of left a little button on the bottom for design considerations. And I guess we probably ought to slap a uh, finish on here. We'll do that. Won't take but a second with that uh, shellac. Could you pass that wrench around, please? Sure. <laughs> I guess I never realized you could just put shellac in a plastic bottle. I always thought it'd rot it through or something, but I saw somebody did this, and I thought, well, I have to give that a try. So I did this the other, other night in a little squeeze bottle so I could have something small to carry with me. And I thought, well, let's give this a try. The nice thing about it, it does dry very fast. I know one box maker, Chris Stott, has got a book out on 50 boxes or something. He actually uses, uh, oops, didn't mean to put any on the tenon here. Uh, he is, uses a sanding, uh, a lacquer type sanding sealer. And I tried that and I thought, well, this is pretty nice because it's just super fast. But I don't think it's quite as hard as, uh, as lacquer. I'm not sure why he didn't use lacquer. We put a little friction on it so it'll dry it pretty quick. That takes care of that one. Is that lacquer or varnish? Uh, this is lacquer. Okay. Um, I thought you said I used, started using friction originally, but it doesn't, it's just not as hard. So here's where I use that other size that I grabbed the first time for the top, since I can no longer use the bottom. So I get the one that says 5 8 That's a little loose. I learned a long time ago, trainer always takes a roll of tape with him to, you know, put up flip charts and stuff. It's always nice to have some handy. And this doesn't have to be super tight since all we're doing is putting a little finish on here. I find the hardest part is getting it into that texturing. You gotta take a moment and really rub it in, especially when you have tiny little beads. You don't work at it a little bit and you won't get it in all the little crevices. Sometimes you gotta open the cloth up and stick your fingernail in that crevice to get it in there. So have I inspired anybody in here to go home and make a pillbox? Yep. Yeah, right where you said <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> it doesn't have a uh, uh, draw bar on it. <laughs> That's why you gotta tap you gotta tap that in and it, and you gotta work it. Takes a little practice to get those more tapers down. All right, so we can put that in our put that in our raffle.